Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm making an outdoor workbench slash potting bench. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. It's a cedar work surface for my wife for her flowers and stuff. You guys stick around and I'll show you how I made it. Here's the final design that I had settled on. Uh, this is an outdoor bench, so it's got slats that are kind of spaced apart so water can get through. I think it would be perfect for a workbench and you could put a layer of three quarter inch plywood or even better yet, I think if you laminated two layers of three quarter inch plywood for a top, you would have a nice solid work surface. And the joinery here lends itself really nice to an indoor workbench. Uh, I'll have a measured drawing and cut list available for anyone that's interested in building this project, but this is the design that I settled on. Here you can see other iterations that I had, you know, that involved two by fours, that the legs weren't necessarily symmetrical and slats going in various directions. That kind of played a little bit with structure underneath. Uh, here I had four by fours. Those weren't symmetrical at that point in time. This one had the slats going in the opposite direction and kind of a, a basin. And here was my original design from way back when. You can tell this design is old because it's back when CAD was in black and white. And that had some kind of grill grate thing that I think overcomplicated it. So it ultimately settled back on this iteration here. And let's focus on the frame for right now. Oddly enough, this project started off in the lumber yard because it was a lot less expensive for me to buy a 12 foot four x four and cut it into two six foot sections than it was to buy two six foot four x fours. Sometimes it works out that way. So that's a tip if you guys, you know, check to see those on the pricing. I, I think I ended up saving like 15 bucks there. So let's move on to the legs. Being it was gonna be an outdoor project, I figured why not work outdoors and enjoy the weather. So I got out my miter saw and set everything up there and started making a few cuts. And started by cutting my four by fours in half. This is gonna do a couple things. It's gonna give us a nice clean edge, but it's also gonna be nice and square. Then I could, well, put the dust bag on my miter saw. I forgot to do that. And uh, you wanna make sure to also remove these staples. Uh, you know, metal staples and blades really don't play well together, so. And then I was cutting these essentially to final length and getting rid of that kind of gnarly factory edge on the bottom, making sure it was nice and square, sneaking up to make sure I was right on my measurement and that I was gonna ensure that I had four identical length legs. And it was pretty much the same procedure on the remaining chunk of four by four I had to make two additional legs. I'll warn you ahead of time, this project does have a bit of repetition to it. Then I was gonna turn my attention onto the long rails. And those started out as cedar two by fours and essentially the, almost the same procedure here from the legs. These ones are gonna be a little bit longer so basically cut them in half and then measure them out to be the exact same length. I was gonna need a total of four of these long rails. Then onto the shorter side rails, same thing here. And as you can tell, this is kind of a miter saw rich project. And we'll need four of these rails as well. I tried to gang up some of my cuts to make sure that I had exactly the same length pieces. Once you're done cutting all your frame pieces to final length, you should end up with four legs that are made out of four by fours, four long rails and four short rails. I then added a scrap piece of 2x4 to my miter saw fence and secured that in place with a couple screws. That was going to allow me to make some non-through cuts when I focus here on the milling operation for the legs. It's kind of a half lap mitered rabbit dado sort of thing. It's a super strong joint and works really well on a workbench. This miter saw has one of these little flip stops and then an adjustment screw so that you can adjust if the miter saw comes down completely through the work. And that's exactly what we wanna do is stop it from going through the work and you just adjust it to your layout line. And then I made a couple test cuts in the end. It's never a bad thing to just make sure and check on your actual work piece that you have it set up properly. Before I added that kerf cut in that fence and that's really great for lining up on our layout lines because we know exactly where the blade's gonna be coming through. Then basically I just gotta hog away this material. There's a couple different ways of doing it. Here I'm just each and every pass moving it over the blade thickness. It's a little bit repetitive, but it actually goes pretty quick. Then you can just rotate the piece, line up the shoulder of that rabbit and continue. Here I employ a little bit different method where you're spacing it out to where you're actually leaving material between the curve cuts. 
and eventually when you get down to the end you can just take whatever you have handy to break away some of those chunks and pieces and kind of start getting a flat bottom in this method you will however have to clean that up with either a router plane or a chisel and here you can see I'm cleaning it up with a chisel then I was going to turn my attention to the dados for the bottom rails essentially the same cut but it's actually encapsulated with wood on both sides a really strong joint for anti-racking and twisting of the workbench and marked out everything in my location and again made sure to kind of triple check that I'm not cutting these on the opposite side. These, these dados are on the same side as the rabbits on the top. So some marker is a nice visual indicator and that always helps. And I didn't go full width right away. I kind of checked it with a scrap piece of my material, made a cut, checked it, and then made another cut. And in this case it fit. And it was a nice little friction fit, something that you know would hold itself in place and that was perfect. And then it was rotate the piece and finish up the remaining dado on that leg. And again, with the repetition, I just basically made four legs the same way on this. The neat thing about this design is you don't necessarily have a left or a right leg. All four legs are the same. That definitely helps when it comes time for assembly. You know, you don't have to worry about whether something's left-handed or right-handed. If you want to clean up your rabbits or your dados by sliding it back and forth, that's always a good option. If you're not comfortable with that, definitely skip that. But Now let's turn our attention over to the rails. We'll call it kind of a mitered rabbit and I'll work on the long ones and the short ones. They basically get the same treatment on the edge. You want to mark where that shoulder is going to be because once we put that 45 on there, it won't necessarily be a, a good place to mark that. So I, on all the pieces, I marked exactly where the shoulder of that rabbit needs to be. And then I could turn my miter saw to 45 degrees. And this is where I was going to sneak up on the cut. All the rails are at the final length that we need. And so it's just make a test cut, sneak up on it. We don't want to shorten the piece, but we do want that 45 degree to come to a point that's going to be the miter for our rails when they wrap around our legs. As far as how deep to make the rabbits, I then took a piece of scrap wood and pounded it into one of my leg posts. Once it was fully seated, I could mark where it met the post and kind of draw a little squiggly line there for my waistline and then bring that back over to my miter saw. That helped me set the depth adjustment right to my layout line. I started off by establishing that shoulder cut and then I could bring that back over to my leg and pound it in place and you can see here that the kerf should be just flush with the surface of that post when you have it in backwards. So if it's not flush, if it's, if it's too deep, your cut was too deep, if it's too shallow, then your cut was too shallow. Being everything lined up for me, then it was just back to the miter saw to hog away all that material. I really dig this design because all the rail ends are all the same milling operation so once you're set up for it you're actually just kind of good to go. And again if you want to move it back and forth to kind of clean it up that does a really good job. I know some people aren't comfortable with doing that so kind of work at your discretion. Then I just wanted to triple check here I guess and just make sure everything kind of lines up and then that's essentially what you should look like. It should kind of come even to the edge and have a 45 degree miter where the other piece mates up with it. Now we can concentrate on the front and back, we'll call them sub-assemblies. And I preach this a lot in my videos, and that's to do a dry fit. I know a lot of people like skipping that step, but it is actually kind of critical. This way, if you're out of square or something's not lining up, this would be the time to correct it, rather than having a bunch of glue and everything all over. And I just did some diagonal measurements to double check, make sure I was square, and I was pretty much good to go. Uh, using an outdoor rated glue, and I use plenty of it. I, I kind of like to think of this joint with all the face grain to face grain as the glue is really, you know, the star of the show and the screws are just there kind of as temporary clamps uh, or a belt and suspenders type approach. At this point, I put just two screws in each of those joints. I initially had something planned uh, it didn't quite work out for you know a, a different fastening system. I'll have to save that for a different day, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And you know, pretty much put your lower rail and your upper rail in, secure it with a couple screws. You can actually use three screws, but like I said, I'll I'll get to that in a second. And make sure to clean up the glue as it's squeezing out. Using that much, you're going to have squeeze out. You want it nice and flat so your joiner, you know, if it looks like this and it dries, you know, your next piece is not going to be sitting in there nice and flush. 
And while the glue was setting up, I just, again, checked to make sure that it was square by measuring my diagonals. I was off by a sixteenth of an inch, and I was able to just kind of pound that back in place. I then took that opportunity to snap a picture here for Instagram to kind of highlight the joinery. If you're interested in following the projects kind of as they progress, go and check me out over on Instagram. After giving that sub-assembly a little bit of time for that glue to kind of tack up so that moving it wasn't going to throw it out of whack, I pretty much could repeat and build one more sub-assembly and you guys don't need to see me building the same thing twice. Then using a short rail piece and a couple clamps just to kind of hold the pieces next to each other, it was time to install the short rail. Same thing here, test fit it and then add some glue and a couple screws. This miter joint is really a nice joint in a couple regards. It's A, super strong because the shoulder on the rabbit and the two shoulders on the dado really help against racking, but then not exposing that miter joint gives it a nice aesthetic look, but it also is functional because you're not exposing end grain to the weather and end grain and finish sometimes don't play nicely in the sandbox together. Then it was just continue with the upper and lower rails, wrapping my way around to the beginning and hammering it home. I had a little, you can see the gap here on the front side and it just, the bottom wasn't all the way together. So a little tap with a hammer and everything was good to go. Here you can see a close up of that mitered rabbit joint. It's a really beautiful joint. It comes together really nice. At this point, I wanted to make sure that the bench itself was flat. I did a completely separate video on that using a couple scrap pieces and uh, if you guys are interested, I'll leave a link down in the description below for that video as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I had plans to kind of use a different fastener in this corner. Um, didn't end up working out, maybe on a different project, but I just added a third screw, making sure to go into the 4x4 and that that screw didn't go in between the 4x4 and the 2x4. Then it was on to sanding. Keep in mind, this was dimensional cedar, so it wasn't necessarily the smoothest thing in the world. And just for kind of user ease, I wanted to make sure there weren't any big, large chunks and splinters. I wasn't necessarily sanding to 220. I think I went to 120. Then using a blower, I blew everything off when I was done sanding, and it was on to finish. I'm using a water-based outdoor finish. Uh, it actually comes in a bag, which is kind of neat. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but uh, I was straining it because at the end, I was if I had extra finish left over, I was putting it back in the bag to try and save on finish. And so I was making sure to strain that each and every time I poured some new stuff out. I started with the bottom end grain of the legs. End grain is just a thirsty, you know, it's just that, that wicking nature of the fiber of the wood. And you can see here, it's just, it just soaks it up. And this bench, for the time being, is going to be sitting on the ground. Maybe I'll get some patio pavers or something to lift it up and get, you know, get it out of the elements. But definitely make sure you get a good three or four, if not more, coats on that end grain. Let it soak up as much as possible and that'll hopefully prevent any type of water infiltration in the future. Then the base itself pretty much got three or four coats. It, it, this stuff was pretty decent. It dried in about an hour and then I was ready to go. Then I could move my attention over to the slats, more so the full width slats. So it was back to the miter saw and I didn't necessarily notice it at the time until I saw the video footage but the wind had picked up substantially, and uh, yeah, it was it was about to storm pretty good. But So I was hoping to get these top pieces and the bottom shelf pieces cut to length, and pretty much the same thing here. Every, each of these pieces, the design is really nice. Each of these pieces are exactly the same length, except for two of them that go in between the posts on the bottom. You can really see that wind because the sky went from a really nice blue sky to storming pretty quick. So essentially I moved operations into the shop, which was perfect timing actually. All those slats got sanded and then also break the edges. Not only is it kind of a, a nice creature comfort and it's just an easier on the touch, but it's actually really good on the finish to not have a sharp knife edge on all your pieces. Here you can see a before and after of those edges. Kind of a round over meets chamfer. Either way, it looks nice, had a nice feel to it. Then it was finish time again. All the slats needed to get three coats. Uh, I think on the top ones, I put four coats. Basically brush on the finish and let it dry. I started again with the end grain, because when you start with the end grain, then you do the face grain. By that time, the end grain already soaked it up and you can touch up the ends again. Here was after one coat of finish and two coats. 
after the second coat, I just used some sanding pads to break down some of the fuzzies and stuff like that and to get the finish here from this to this. I probably went a little bit further on that than I needed to, but, and here you can see a little drying rack. I actually built that on Instagram. If you follow me over there, you saw that. It sped up the process of finishing all this stuff substantially. Then it was to move on to the narrower slats. Beforehand, I picked out a couple of the pieces from the top and bottom slats that were nice and clear. They had no knots because I knew I was gonna be ripping them down and if you had a knot in the middle of a real narrow piece, it might just break in half. So I could raise my table saw blade up and move my fence over to where it needs to be and rip eight pieces. This is essentially the feature that differentiates it from a potting bench versus just a normal outdoor workbench. At this time, I also cut two pieces that were a little bit wider, and those were gonna act as runners for my little bin or bucket underneath, the yellow pieces pictured here. And then the blue and red ones, I also had cut left over from those slats. I basically cut one slat more than what I needed. Pretty much same procedure here. All the edges get broken. And for those little drawer slide runners, I guess we'll call them, I glued on a couple little you know, standoff brackets and let those set up. And then again, pretty much everything got a finish. You can see the rails here on this little finish rack. I turned 45 degrees. That way my non-show side, that's where it could rest. And there was only a tiny little line showing, but that way I could get all six sides of each of the pieces right away. And finishing actually went rather quick that way. And being this finishes in a bag, I'm able to squeeze out all the air when I'm all said and done. That way the finish isn't gonna go bad. These smaller pieces, I drilled a center hole and you know it makes me sleep better at night, but I also put a little dab of finish on that raw wood. And these basically get screwed on to the bottom side and they just give a little spot for the outer slats to sit on. So it's not just kind of hanging out into nothingness. There you go with that bottom slat, they just, that's where they sit. And the, each end gets two of those, so a total of four. I was gonna be starting on the bottom, so with all my slats finished, I just kinda positioned them how I wanted them as far as where the grain goes and you know some darker pieces, some lighter pieces, because by choosing which slats were gonna be on the bottom, I was inadvertently choosing which slats were gonna be on the top. So I made sure to kinda lay everything out. You could use spacers or a ruler or you know, a multitude of different ways, but I, they were close enough together and I figured, hey, it just kind of looked good to the eye, so it must be halfway decent. I started on the ends, uh, that way it kind of encapsulates or frames in, you know, if you have your two end pieces secured, then all the ones in the field have to go in there somewhere. So it kind of, I don't know, it gives you boundaries to go off of. And it was just drill some holes, use the dowel centers to locate those on the board, drill some holes on there and then insert some dowels with glue into those pieces and that secured it real nice. I really, you know, with the way the cedar was looking, I really didn't like the idea of putting screws in the face of this, whether they were little trim screws with small heads or anything like that. I just, I had to go this dowel route because just how beautiful and rich that, that would look and I'm glad I did. It was worth the extra time in my opinion. Then I clamped a level to the back of the bench. The back was gonna be flush and then the front has a slight overhang. And that way I was able to kind of butt all my pieces in there and they were going to be nice and even against that straight edge. Then I could do some final you can't position. Me. Yeah, I guess such is life. Anyways, after some final positioning, I was ready to attach all of those. As for the slats in the middle, those were going to receive four dowels. That was just a matter of drilling four holes using the dowel centers, pushing those dowel centers into the board and making little indentation marks and then I could drill those holes, add some glue, add some dowels, and just tap it home. It was pretty much good to go and just basically repeat the process after that. I know there are some that would probably argue that this is way too much work, but I'm pretty sure that the results speak for themselves. I was super pleased about it, so was my wife, so you can't beat that. It's just that whole fastener-free look. Then it was onto the top, pretty much same thing here except we had those, those other slats. In the CAD drawing, I had the outermost pieces flush with those rails. I wanted to pull them out a little bit, not only for aesthetics, but it kind of acts as a little bit of a drip edge to where water's not necessarily gonna wanna wrap itself around and go underneath. At least that's the thought anyways. I didn't add a curve or anything to the bottom, like a normal drip edge, but same thing here. Dowels, drill holes. I use dowels as spacers as far as the overhang and everything, but uh, outside of that, nothing out of the norm. 
Like I mentioned earlier, I'll have a cut list and measured drawing available for both the workbench with the plywood top and the outdoor workbench with the slats. And that'll have all the measurements for overall length, the detailed measurements on the joinery and all that stuff. But as far as it goes to when you do these slats, you don't necessarily want to make some oddball, weird spacer size, like a, I don't know, 730 seconds or, you know. So I just eyeballed it. If it looks good and straight to the eye, it probably is. So that's something I really didn't bother with trying to measure exact. Then it was pretty much repeat these boards until I had all the full width boards in place. I left an opening here for those shorter slats. The only thing different there was they were just going to get one double on each side. That's just how wide they were. And I also cleaned out any glue squeeze out from that dowel with a rag. That way I was going to try and have to get in any glue squeeze out and clean in between these slats. I was basically relying on the dowel as a kind of a floating tenon, and that was really where all my holding power was going to come from anyways. And then I got smart and I just marked and drilled all of them all at once. Those lower brackets that we glued together before, I could pre-drill those, and again, it makes me sleep better at night just knowing there's a little bit of finish on that bare wood. Then it was to add these plastic tubs that I got. Uh, again, links to everything in the website article, and I'll have that link down in the description below. But I could center that over that opening where the slats were and basically line this first runner up even with that. Once I had one side secure, just measured it and screwed down the other side. Then I just put the bin back in place and then took that runner and bumped it out ever so slightly. I would say, I don't know, three sixteenths, maybe a quarter inch, and then secured it with a screw and did the same thing to the other side. And once I had the bench flipped around, you can kind of see the idea here, that dirt falling below into the bin. I think it works out pretty slick. As I mentioned before, I'm gonna have a cut list with measured drawing available, have more information down in the description of the video below. And uh, I'm super, super pleased with how this one turned out. It started out with the base, because the, the base with the kind of rabbited, dadoed, lapped, mitered corners, whatever you want to call them, I've done that. It's perfect for workbenches. In fact, this would make an ideal workbench. It's a super sturdy design in that joinery. And then uh, maybe a couple layers of three quarter inch plywood laminated on top. I've yet to do this I don't even know what you call it, but it's kind of like a little grill grate. And for anyone that's not familiar with exactly how that works is, you know, you put your pot over there and as you're planting your flower or whatever it is, you, any dirt that spills over falls into the bin below. Um, links to everything in the website article and I'll have that link down in the description below. But my wife was super pleased. In fact, she didn't waste any time whatsoever getting ready and and getting her potting stuff out. In fact, she kind of commandeered my work area before I even had the, the brackets for that bottom bin on. And she tried it out right away and loves it. And I, I couldn't be happier. I hope I'm able to capture what that cedar looks like. It's just so warm. It's just a beautiful wood. It's just one of those things to where, you know, you start at it one way and you kind of go, oh man, because I was, I was gonna attach these top boards with screws and it just was, it seemed like such a shame to have to do that. And it seemed like a shame to, so that's why I went with the dowels. And that's definitely a neat trick to kind of get this flawless, seamless design without any fasteners or anything like that. But uh, a special thank you to Sears for sponsoring this video, making this video possible. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, leave those below. I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this. Again, uh, I'll have all the information, any of the stuff that I used in the website article at nickferry.com. And you can find that exact link down in the description below. And I appreciate you guys watching. If this is your first time here, hit that subscribe button and I will see you guys on the next project. Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Nick. Today, today it's time out. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. My cameraman is gonna steal third. <laughs> Oh, these bugs are killing me, killing me softly with his bug.